How has Xi Jinping's leadership shaped China? In an unprecedented move, the Communist Party is set to extend his tenure as leader. But what does it mean for China's future, both at home and abroad? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Emily Angwin. He is the most powerful communist leader in China since Mao Zedong. Now the Communist Party Congress, which is held every five years, is set to extend President Xi Jinping's leadership for a historic third term. This will, of course, have significant impact on the world's second largest economy and the region at large. Xi used his opening speech to declare Beijing's global power had increased while warning of dangerous storms ahead. He called for faster military growth and defended his government's zero COVID approach. He also raised the issue of Hong Kong, saying it must be ruled by what he calls patriots. The new leadership lineup is expected to be revealed in about a week from now. We'll get to our guests in just a moment, but first, this report from Adrian Brown. President Xi Jinping's grip on power would now appear absolute. If he has enemies, then they're hidden or unknown, or both. But some of those who've chronicled Xi's career say, you don't get to the top of Chinese politics without eliminating rivals and making enemies. He does, but it needs to be said that the Congress is an act of state pageantry. The fact that this Congress is happening means that these rivals have already been largely pushed to the sidelines. After becoming Communist Party chief a decade ago, Xi vowed to root out dishonest officials, both high-ranking tigers and low-level flies. The campaign went down well with the public, especially when it ensnared powerful and wealthy figures. Bo Chi Lai was a rising star of Chinese politics, even tipped as a future president. But within months of Xi becoming leader, Bo was serving a life sentence for corruption and abuse of power. No one was untouchable, including Zhao Yongkang, the man who'd been in charge of state security. He's also serving a life term for corruption and disclosure of state secrets. And the purge is not over. And more than four million people have been caught up in it. So it's been a very effective tool for Xi Jinping to both instill discipline within the Communist Party, but also clamp down on his rivals. Other analysts say the continuing campaign against corruption ahead of this Congress will ensure that Xi strengthens his hand over appointments to key decision-making bodies. Xi has led China for a decade. Now he's expected to end precedent by being appointed to a third term as party chief. So having seized control of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping then seized control of China and China has become a lot less free, a lot more oppressive, far less open than it was 10 years ago. It's an accumulation of power unseen since Chairman Mao. And no leader since him has built a personality cult as strong. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera. Let's bring in our guests in Beijing. Victor Gao is the Vice President at the Centre for China and Globalisation. In Hong Kong, Andrew Liang, an international and independent China strategist. And in St Albans, in UK, Stephen Vines, the author of the book Defying the Dragon, Hong Kong and the World's Largest Dictatorship. A very warm welcome to each of you. Andrew, I'd like to start with you. Xi's power remains strong inside the CCP. That's certainly not in doubt. But what about outside it? Are the tides turning against Xi domestically and internationally? Well, this is a natural uh, almost development. Um, even if you are a panda, uh, you would become a million pound panda, then your presence uh, would be felt and your influence uh, would, of course, uh, raise concerns and and anxiety uh, amongst um, your neighbours or your um, 
challenger uh, or perceived uh, rival. Um, but I think that the uh, presidency is uh, is taking uh, is seen to be taking China to a higher plane. Uh, a lot of the the Western um, media is concentrating on certain specific aspects like the uh, COVID nineteen, the the uh, dynamic zero policy, uh, the um, complete control with information marks over Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, but actually uh, C's um, speech is much much more. Uh, um, uh, than that. It is no less than a declaration uh, of a strategic stage in China's development. Because if you look at uh, how China uh, performed uh, over the past um, decades, you know, China started from a very, very poor country uh, and then um, was actually um, had to uh, hide its light under the bushel uh, and, of course, have got to um, keep a low profile because China simply. Um, does not have the comprehensive uh, power to defend its own interests. Now China is now under the tutelage uh, of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, has um, uh, regained uh, China's national self-confidence to project China to the next higher plane. Um, and that's what this um, um, uh, uh, party conference is all about. Um, it's not about um, um, uh, uh, President Xi's holding on to power because um, he highlighted uh, the the, uh, the problems uh, and the challenges China would face in this trajectory, both domestic and, and international. Uh, domestic because of the demographics and um, and the um, the need to um, uh, to grow self reliance in uh, technologies subject to U.S. sanctions and so on and so forth, um, and, um, and 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 external hostile environment. So uh, the consensus amongst the parties that C is the man to do the job. Speaking of Xi being the man to do the job, Stephen, I wanted to ask you just how popular is Xi among people in China? Are they happy to see him stay on for a third term? Well, the, the simple answer to that question is we don't know because there is no freedom of expression in China. The impression is that, that um, people do support him, but the reality is because you live in a society where nobody can openly say what they really feel, unless like you know, Mr. Lung, who we've just heard, who echoes the party line, unless they're doing that, it's um, very difficult to know. What we do know, though, and is very interesting, is that in the wider world, you have these surveys that are put out by the Pew Institute, which measures popularities of various world leaders and countries. And in the outside world, the popularity and appreciation of the People's Republic of China has declined very rapidly in practically all countries of the world since the accession of General Secretary Xi. Victor Gao, I want to pick up on what Stephen just said in terms of the censorship. We're bombarded with images of strength and the power of the CCP, and the censorship of China is, is no secret. But doesn't that also highlight the insecurity of the party and Xi, given they're afraid of even the slightest criticism? Now, first of all, please allow me to remind our audience that China has the most dynamic and very sophisticated internet system. Everyone is wearing a speaker in front of him, and everyone talks about things at his will on the mobile phone, in the internet, for example. And I think this is the reality in China. Now, China does have censorship. There is a short list of things that people are not allowed to talk about, for example, Taiwan independence, Hong Kong independence, Tibetan independence, Uyghur independence, for example. These are taboo issues. And China and the Chinese people support the government in stamping out these very controversial issues, for example, and we all unite together to fight against these separatist movements in Taiwan or originally a couple of years ago in Hong Kong. This is not dissent. This is really people getting together uh, for the same direction of maintaining sovereignty and territorial integrity. If anyone believes that China does not have freedom of expression on the internet or on your mobile phone, then come to China and see what exactly is happening on the ground. Now, I would say the Chinese consumers spend more time on internet and on their mobile phone 
probably than people in many other countries. Part of the reason is because the broadband system is very good, 5G is very popular, and affordability of the smartphones in China is very popular. So you should remind everyone that China is one of the best connected countries in the world. Everyone talks about everything on the internet except that short list of taboo issues. I want to get to that list in just a moment, but Stephen, I noticed you were shaking your head there in disagreement while, uh, Andrew, you were nodding. Well, I mean, the facts of the matter, and this is well known to both of the other guests, is that there is not a limited number of subjects which are taboo. There's a very vast number of subjects that are taboo. And just let's take one example. During the COVID crisis, which is still raging, um, access to the internet was shut down to people who criticised the authorities for the way they were handling the pandemic. It's also a fact that Chinese citizens cannot legally access the World Wide Web. I mean, astonishing that this hasn't just been mentioned. All of the internet is very tightly controlled. China does not have access, for example, to apps such as Google, such as WhatsApp. All of these search engines and all of these communication um, apps are developed independently in China and are very severely controlled. And if you're a person who's known to have said anything loosely uh, on one of these devices, you get shut down. It's as simple as that. Let's bring the conversation, I guess, back to the Congress and to Xi Jinping's leadership. Um, Andrew, what impact has the draconian zero COVID policy had on Xi's leadership and also his popularity? Well, first of all, I, I'd like to address the uh, perception uh, that somehow uh, the Chinese um, Communist Party is um, uh, unstable, uh, or the society seems to have a, a, a lot of backlash against the, the party. Well, this is a complete travesty uh, of the truth. And I'm referring to the Harvard Kennedy School uh, study, which came out uh, six or nine months ago. Um, uh, it's a longitudinal study. It's not just a one-off. It's based on a track record of similar studies in the past, uh, using the Harvard Kennedy School's proprietary research tools, uh, which confirmed that China, the Communist Party government is the most supported by its people, compared with other countries, many other countries, including Western democracies um, in the, like the United States. In fact, multiple ranks above the United States, as much as 80 or 90 percent of the people support the Communist Party because their lives have changed miraculously under its tutelage uh, over so many years. Regardless of the regime, regardless of uh, what type of government you have, I think the test of the pudding is in the eating, whether your people have experienced you know, better lives, you know, better livelihood, um, and, 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 and have uh, greater aspirations. So on these metrics, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is highly supported by its people. So this kind of rhetoric um, about differences in freedoms, because each country has different uh, political, uh, historical, and, 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 and various other differences. I mean, it's just like the, raising a family. You know, the way I raised my family is very different from your, you raise your family. And to expect that there is a one yardstick to measure all things, uh, I think that this is this a travesty. Sure, but coming uh, back to the question about the zero COVID policy, what impact has that had on his leadership and going well, forward on his popularity? Because we have seen protests. I mean, even a few days before the Congress party, there were images of banners being put up on a bridge in the um, in the northwest of Beijing. Well, that, that, that was a long wolf kind of thing. Um, um, as I said, I mean, it, it does not change the reality that the great um, the majority of the Chinese people support the party. Now, coming back to the pandemics, um, I think the presidency also uh, explained uh, that, of course, the, the, um, the, the, the lives uh, of the Chinese people are put on much higher plane compared with economics. Uh, if you look at the death rate uh, of the pandemic in the United States. One million people have died uh, in the United States uh, because of the pandemic. Um, the Chinese population is four times as big as, as the United States. So if you uh, adopt a similar kind of uh, measures in the United States, and then there's a risk that uh, China would face four million deaths. 
Um, and and these uh, uh, kind of scenario, scenario would impact most uh, on the most vulnerable uh, groups, uh, the elderly or the the less privileged. So this is completely unacceptable sure. uh, to the Communist Party. But one impact that we can all agree on is the impact on the economy. And if I can address the question to you, Victor Gao, what's been the impact on China's economy as a result of this zero COVID policy? And will she soften his approach going forward, do you think? Well, first of all, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, China has the highest success rate in fighting off this pandemic. And I agree with uh, Mr. Leong in terms of the death rates or infection rates, China has the lowest rates. That means China has saved more people from infections or from deaths. From the Chinese perspective, herd immunity is really an indication of the complete incompetence of the governments involved because they cannot save their own people. They cannot prevent the widespread of the pandemic. As a result, the people become victims. They lose their lives. They get infections. They go to ICUs. In China, we want to do the other way. And uh, allow me to emphasize once again, every country has the right to come up with its own way to deal with the pandemic. And China's way is to prevent as many people as possible from getting infections or dying from right. the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, you talked about the economic costs. Allow me to emphasize that China has made its choice completely, fully aware of the economic costs. That means after weighing all the costs economically, the Chinese government still decided to save as many people as possible because we do believe saving people's lives, including elderly people, is very much part of the human rights for the Chinese people. We want to prevent as many people from dying or infections from the pandemic. And this will be the continued focus. Now, the dynamic zero COVID policy does not mean it will not be changed or modified. Originally, it was two weeks plus one week, 21 days in total. Now it's seven days plus three days. And I truly believe that after the 20th Party Congress, it probably will be reduced down to five days or two days or another one day, okay. for example. So it is being modified. And eventually, we all want to have life going back to normal, but not on the precondition that more people get infections and more people in China die from infections. Uh, Victor Gao, you mentioned human rights, which brings me to my next issue that I want to address. Stephen, I'll address this to you. A human rights report uh, from the UN said China was responsible for serious human rights violations in the Xinjiang province. Is Xi's continued tenure as leader a disaster for human rights, as Amnesty International has described it? I don't think there's any serious question that human rights in China, which were already at a very low level, have deteriorated under the period of Xi Jinping's rule. In um, Xinjiang, in the um, Turkic regions of China, of course, that has become a very dramatic situation with alleged genocide, with literally hundreds of thousands of people being interned, with mass sterilizations of Uyghur females, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, I mean, it's, it's not just in, in Xinjiang. I mean, in, in, in Hong Kong, a free society which was guaranteed under international treaty to be able to maintain its way of life has now found most forms of freedom, most forms of liberty extinguished, and the jails are full of political prisoners. So if the question is, has there been anything other than a deterioration of human rights in China, the answer is very emphatic. It has got worse. And I think that the longer you have not only one party rule, because obviously that's what you have in China, but one man rule, um, the toleration for any form of dissent within the borders of the PRC is going to actually continue to, to move downwards. Andrew, why didn't she mention Xinjiang specifically in his speech to Congress today? Well, I think that this is uh, highlighted, of course, by the West all the time. I mean, during the, uh, the past couple of months, or if not year, uh, which is, of course, as I said, a, a complete travesty of the truth. Uh, because, the, you know, the, 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 the accusation of forced labor, if you look at the 
the way uh, that, for example, cotton is collected is, is completely mechanized. So what is the forced labor? And, 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 and of course, the, uh, there's no doubt that a lot of the um, uh, Xinjiang uh, activists uh, for separatism have been arrested. Well, this is a fact, uh, like any other country, national security is important. But to say, to, to say this genocide, uh, I think is over the tops. Um, but I think that this is a, a, a Xinjiang, of course, is a, a very important part of, of China's province uh, and, and holds a very strategic position. So this, um, 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 the, the West accusations are completely unfounded and it's part of this demonization of China. That's why. So just it to was clarify, what you're saying for... is the UN Human Rights Report, the United Nations Human Rights Report, is inaccurate. Well, um, uh, it is uh, um, uh, 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 at least, you know, sort of partially, if not completely in, in, uh, in, inaccurate, uh, because it's not, A, the, the accusations are not based on uh, concrete evidence. I mean, you can always single out certain cases. I mean, you can look at the um, prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, for example, and say the whole the United States is, is a dictatorial uh, country, likewise. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay is as big as Xinjiang. But it's not a question of extent. So every country has got, has its own national security um, um, uh, is, is, is the most important imperative. Right. Um, but I think that a lot of accusations are completely over the tops. Speaking of the US, I'll direct this question to Victor. Victor, she has called for military growth. That's obviously coming amid tensions with Washington. How will the relationship with the US play out during Xi's third term? Thank you very much. Before I answer your question about China-U.S. relations, allow me to very quickly talk about Xinjiang. You may know the United Nations Human Rights Commission defeated a draft resolution proposed by the United States and many Western countries accusing China's human rights violations in Xinjiang. And if you read the numbers, most of those countries which defeat the U.S.-sponsored resolutions are actually Arab countries and Muslim countries. That means they support China's position and they believe that the false accusations lodged by the United States and Western countries about human rights situation in Xinjiang are completely fabricated. And I think I agree with Mr. Leong in his assessment of the situation and Xinjiang will remain part of the Chinese territory and the Uyghur people will always remember our brothers and sisters and the false accusations will really not be generated or turned into any concrete actions because China's sovereignty over Xinjiang will be ironclad. Mr. Gao, we're China running US short of time, so if you wanted to respond to my question about Washington, yes. that would be great. Exactly. China-US relations are really deteriorating and the United States has not come to terms with the fact that China will soon surpass that of the United States as far as the size of the economy is concerned. And they also worry that once China surpasses that of the United States, China will replace the United States as the top dog in the world. China's view is just the opposite. China's economic development will continue, and in less than 10 years' time, probably much less than that, China's size of the economy will be that bigger than that of the United States. However, China sees no fun of becoming the next top dog in the world. Why? Because China wants to treat every country, big or small in the world, as an equal. And China will never impose its ways, its views right. and its way of doing things onto any other country in the world. Well, it's certainly a conversation which has ignited a lot of passion and I appreciate all of you for taking the time to speak with us. Unfortunately, we have run short of time, so we have to leave it there. But thank you to all of our guests, Victor Gao, Andrew Leung and Stephen Vines. And thank you too for watching at home. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story. From me, Emily Angwin, and the entire team here, bye for now.